us, Lord. Lord, we just pray, just minister to us today, Lord. Touch our hearts, touch our spirits, Lord. Lord, just lead us in your way, take us deeper. We just give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Is God good? And what was that? All the time. He's all the time. Good. Praise the Lord. You know, church should be a place where you have fun, right? You enjoy one another. You enjoy the Lord. You can enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I haven't heard, read a scripture yet where you enter his gates depressed. You come in and you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you get filled with the presence of God, and you feel that anointing flowing in your life, and and it gives you the strength and encouragement to go out for your busy week that's ahead of us, and we need to get that fire of the Holy Spirit in us. Well, we've been talking last week, we, what did we talk about? Anybody remember what we talked about last week? Huh? Sons. Difference between a son and a a child. We come to the Lord as children. We're born again. By birth, we become come into the family of God. But do we stay as children? Or do we grow into maturity to be sons of God? And now again, new people, we gotta specify that we're not. When we say sons, it's not gender specific. We're all sons of God. Ladies, if you can be a son of God here, I can be God's Jesus' wife for eternity. Okay? So it's not a gender thing. It's an it's a anointing of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. That we are, we are in the process. We are betrothed. We went through the two, two weeks um, on uh, the marriage and all of the things that are going in, and where we're waiting for our, the bridegroom to come in and take us away to the uh, consummation of the relationship for seven week, seven days, seven years, kind of kind of goes together there, has a ring to it. And so last week we talked about being sons, the difference between a child and a son. We come to the Lord as a child, but do we stay as a child? We're to grow. We're to mature. We're to grow in our faith. And that's a sad part of, I see, in a lot of the church culture is that we get people saved and then we give them Bible, little Bible stories every week. We make them feel good. We sing a few songs, but we never really develop into the sons of God. Sons rule. Children don't. And so... What we are facing before us in the culture and the world today takes sons of God. We need to grow and mature in our faith and understand what our responsibility is as a son. Because a son is a builder of the family name. So as many cultures, a Jewish culture, is when a son hit about 30 years old, the father would set him up in business. He would turn over the business, the family business, or set him up in a business, and he would carry on. It's interesting that in the Jewish culture, 30 years was a, was a time. What time did Je- what, how old was Jesus when he started his ministry? 30 years old. So, uh, so we've been talking about you know, the importance of being sons. Today, I want to go a little deeper in this. Sons must understand authority versus power. We must understand what we're, what we're dealing with here with authority and power, what it means to have authority and what it means to have power. Matthew seven twenty eight and 29 it says, And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teachings as he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. They were teaching the word, the Torah. But what was the difference? 
They didn't have authority. They were just teaching the ritual of the church. This is what you have to do. This is you have to sacrifice. You have to do all these things. And it's, that was religion-based, not relationship-based. And so they were performing the duties. They were t- teaching the duties that you can come to church, but you can't have your dress to your knees. Your dress has to go to your ankles. Uh, you have to uh, wear a suit and a tie. You have to fit the picture. My sister, when she moved from, they moved from Alaska to Nebraska, where my brother-in-law's family was, and she went into church, and in Alaska, up there, you wore a nice pantsuit, you know, nice je- pants and, and that. And so she walked in, and it's like, oh, my Lord, like sh- heathen walked through the door. How dare you come into the house of God that way? So a lot of those things we've infiltrated in the church are cultural, not spiritual. And so Jesus was had, had taught as one having authority. And they were amazed at this authority. Why was Jesus different than the scribes? Jesus walked and spoke with both knowledge of power and authority. See, he was a mature son. He matured for those 30 years. And then when he went to John the Baptist, and that was when he was commissioned into his ministry. He had grown in the presence of God and his relationship with God in this, this, this body. And as we'll look at some scriptures in a little bit. So have you ever heard of someone talk about or teach something and you know darn well they don't know what they're talking about? That's kind of like a lot of politicians today. (laughs) They're talking about stuff that is just like, you're an idiot. Let me throw this out. Whatever happened to the XY chromosome? (laughs) A male has an XY chromosome and a female has two X chromosomes. That's that's science. We're following the science, right? (laughs) But doctors, I heard a politician say that doctor, oh no, somebody was giving witness before the Senate or whoever it was saying that, well, a lot of doctors miss it at birth, what the gender of the child is. <laughs> and this is a testimony that's on record at the Senate or the House or wherever they were having this, this thing. And it's like, <sighs> okay. <laughs> if you want to learn something you had better talk with someone who knows what they're talking about. The scribes were teaching the law and the word with no spiritual authority or power. It became a ritual and tradition that they were teaching. How much of the church has become ritual and tradition? Depending on your denomination. If you go into this denomination, you, go, you have to do a certain thing. If you go into this denomination, you've got to perform this way. You're Pharisees. Today, people are looking and running to people who are moving in power gifts. Man, that person's moving in power. People will say, boy, that person has a lot of power in God. But we find that some of these people have been moving in power of God are exposed by having adulterous affairs and things going on. I thought of a man that his brother-in-law, powerfully anointed and prophesy and stuff, and he fell away. Become an alcoholic. And he said... 
He'd be sitting at the bar, totally smashed, but he would go down the bar stool and prophesy to every one of them and lay their life out. And he wasn't walking with God. People will say, boy, that person has the power of God in their life. Some have been exposed. I just talked about that. God's power gifts are for the recipient, not for the vessel delivering it. God spoke to Balaam through what? You were very polite. A donkey. So that means God can use a, a donkey to get forth his word. So it's, it's true power and authority. That's what we've got to look at. In healing and miracles, there is a real connection between authority and power. Jesus walked in both. When Jesus healed, he did it in authority. When he did miracles, he did it in his power. Why? Healing is generally the removal or casting away something. A lot of times healing is a manifestation of a demonic activity of going on. A spirit of sickness and disease and stuff. And so he he breaks the spirit that spirit. There can be a degeneration of the body. There could be uh, things that we have ingested or things we've taken. So the body goes through a natural sickness. But there's a power, a gift of healing that we can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So that's a gift. It's, it flows. It's a gift. And it has a power to touch people's lives. But then there's this situation where I've shared with uh, Azusa Street. A, a man came up and had his arm ripped out of the socket because of some an industrial accident. He had no arm at all. Come forward, they laid hands on him, and everyone watched a brand new arm grow out. That's a miracle. But it's the power of God moving. Miracles are generally creation, uh, creating or regenerating something that was lost. Healing can be the removal of spiritual spirits of infirmity, spirits that have trespassed and need to be removed. So there can be a spiritual thing in a person's life that need to be set free from, which is causing the sickness and disease, or it could be a degeneration or something there. The word power is, in Scripture, can be used with uh, two Greek words. Deutimus. We get the word for dynamite, supernatural power, creative or regenerative. Exosia is authority or mastery used in healing, deliverance from spirits with and removal of sickness. So deutimus, the power, is a dynamic force that moves to create, transform, or build that which was destroyed. Moving in power to restore, regenerate what has been lost. Authority is the highest judicial, supernatural control possible. Jesus is the highest authority. And he's delegated his authority to us so we can move as sons in the authority of God in these situations and we can declare something that is not. Another story of a man who's a chaplain in a prison and there happened to be a fight and stuff and a guy lost his his eyes. And the chaplain went to him to pray for him and he felt the Holy Spirit said, restore his eyes. And he laid hands on him and two new eyes popped out. In his head. It didn't come out. <laughs> yeah, two, two new eyes. That's a power 
of regeneration. The power of authority. Now there's a picture I got up here of a police officer. Down here on his hip is his deutimus. <laughs> up there in that badge, that's his exosia. That's his authority. That gives him the power to use the deutimus. He walks because of some municipality, some city, some county gave him, he swore in, and they gave him, commissioned him to walk in the authority and the duty of his office. We have been given authority because we are the sons of God. We have been commissioned by God, the Holy Spirit, to walk in the authority, and we can use the deutimus. We can use the gifts, the powers of God to move and do signs and wonders and miracles. Now, if we want to, I don't want to get into, okay, now this is a miracle, and this is, this is authority. I don't, we don't need to get to there. Just walk in it and pray that the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you what to do. But you have been given the authority right there. You have been commissioned by God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, because of our relationship with Jesus Christ and accepting Him as our Lord and Savior into our life. We've been born again. We're growing and maturing as the sons of God into the place where we walk in that authority, and now we can use the deutimus. And we can transform and change a culture because we're walking in the deutimus power of God. We'll look at power here for a moment. Power deals with miracles. Power is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 But you shall receive power, deutimus, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to me. This power is a gift of the Holy Spirit after the Holy Spirit comes upon us. We walk in the boldness of the Holy Spirit and the confidence because of the Holy Spirit that's in our life. Once these gifts have been given, they will not be taken back. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, For the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. So a person has been gift, an anointing, to do signs and wonders and miracles, but yet he falls away from God. It says those gifts are irrevocable. That's why an alcoholic can prophesy to everybody. Because it's not about him. Because God, is, God can use a donkey to speak his word to somebody to transform. Because God's love for those people sitting in the bar stool, he will use whatever's available to get to them. That, that we are without excuse. God will do everything in his power in our lifetime to get us to him. So when we stand before the day of judgment, we will be without excuse. Because God will say, remember that drunk? I prophesied to you and you knew it. But you didn't change your life. And then remember this time. And remember this time, we will be without excuse. So power is irrevocable. That's why some people can be, have corruption in their life. How is that person moving in the power of the Holy Spirit? Because it's irrevocable. God gave it. A person can have the gifts of the Holy Spirit function in their life, but walk in dysfunction. Matthew 24 24, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. So that means there's going to be those who have, may have come in, been transformed, changed, whatever, and then they fall away. One of the biggest is offenses. People will turn away from the church because the church offended them. And you'll talk to people who have been in church. They don't go to church anymore because that church is full of hypocrites. 
Yeah, if you come back, it'll still be full of hypocrites. We're all hypocrites. None of us are perfect. We're all broken. And if somebody offends you, get your big boy pants and big girl pants on and, and press through. I should not let anyone else dictate to my spiritual future. Because if I, if I don't get over it, I have let that person who is, could be manipulated by the demonic forces and powers to get a root of offense in me, to break my relationship with God, with God so I don't walk in the ecstasy and the deutimous power of God. And that power now can be used for demonic forces. People who are in the demonic realm have power. Satan will take them and their gifts for his purpose. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? Have we not done wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Because the power is irrevocable. You can have a power gift and not be in relationship with God. Many can and will be deceived in the days ahead if we just run after power gifts. Oh, look at the power. Look at the power. I want to know what's behind the power. Because the devil has power. Kings conquer by power, but rule by authority. Power is gift-based, but authority can only, uh, comes only by relationship with the Lord. As a natural king, if you're in relationship with that king, he will delegate to you authority and power that you can speak on his behalf. No relationship, no power, no authority. The same thing in our relationship with God. Our authority comes, has to come in relationship. Big difference. Authority is not a gift. Power is gift, but not the authority. To have authority, you must be in close source of that authority. The authority then is delegated to you. Because you're in relationship with that in authority. So it's like, I go down here to Benton, uh, Benton County, and I go through the training to be a sheriff. Before I get sworn in, I got to get approval of the sheriff. Am I going to uphold the law according to what he sees? Because I am in direct relation. Because every officer out there represents the sheriff department. Who, who is in charge of the sheriff department is the sheriff. So you have to uphold the integrity of the office because rogue police officers and sheriffs can reflect all the way up to the leadership. Type and shadow, Seattle. The police over there and the sheriff's department over there. The, the police department's under the city council like most of them are, but the sheriff's department's been brought under the county commissioners. Our nation was set up as the, as the sheriff is the chief executive officer for the county. Per constitution, he is elected by us. He's not appointed by the county commissioners. He's, a, he's elected by us. So he is the chief executive and law enforcement officer for the county. Over there, he's under the county commissioners. 
So now he has to follow the dictates of the county commissioners. And if they're corrupt, then what happens to the sheriff's department? If the city council is corrupt, what happens to the police department? Who, whose authority are we under? Now, I'll make this clear. You're not under my authority. You're under God's authority. Yes, I am the pastor here, and I've shared my responsibilities to equip you. But I am not your authority. The Holy Spirit is. And every one of us walking in relationship with the Holy Spirit, we're under the dictates of the Holy Spirit. You're not subject to me as the pastor of this house. There's an honor, there's a respect, and there's a working together in this. But our spiritual authority comes from the Holy Spirit and Him alone. Because I could go sideways. And what happened, a lot of times, if, if we deify a pastor or somebody... Oh, they're such a man of God. They're such a woman of God. And they fall. What happens to everybody that has put everything in, into them? They fall too. And that's right where the devil wants us. I'm not going to take on any responsibility that God has not given to me. And, and that is not for me to be your Holy Spirit. I'm here to coach you, help you in your walk with him. When you're on the ball field, you play the game. The coach is on the sidelines. And I'm not in your game. You're in your game, whatever your game is. And so you walk in the authority of the Holy Spirit that's been commissioned to you, and you walk in the deutimus and the exousia power of the Holy Spirit. So the Lord releases and gives us authority as our relationship with Him grows. When Satan fell from heaven, he did not lose his power. He lost his authority. Satan is very powerful. But he has no authority. So Jesus said, He saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. He fell from his relationship with the Father and with his authority. His sin was pride and rebellion. He will never stop falling and drifting away from the light and the glory of God. When a person or a a spiritual being falls, you're falling. You become more corrupt, more corrupt, more corrupt the more you are falling. You're moving away from God. He is further away from God now than he was when he first fell. He's becoming more evil and more corrupt. When we walk away from God, you will become more, or we will move further and further away from God. You keep moving away from the source of light to darkness. The Bible states three levels of darkness. First, darkness. Two, deep darkness. Three, gross darkness. And four, outer darkness. It's progressive. It is authority that makes a difference in the kingdom. You do not lose power, but you drift away. You lose authority. Again, the callings of God are irrevocable. When Jesus uh, met Satan in the wilderness, Satan spoke to, to Jesus in Luke 7, I mean 4, 6 through 7. And the devil, devil said, All authority I will give you, all this authority I will give you, and their glory. For this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. So, okay, if Satan was stripped 
of his authority when he fell, where did he get his authority? He stole it from Adam. He got Adam's authority. He tempted Adam, and Adam sinned. That authority that Adam had to rule and reign over the earth, he lost. Lucifer got it. So that's the authority that he's, we're talking about here. So Adam lost his authority through disobedience, and God removed him from the garden. From God's pr uh, presence and his source of authority in life. From that moment on, sin began to rule in Adam's life. He no longer had the authority. He turned it over to Satan. Mankind began to move further and further away from God, which brings us to Noah. The corruption the decay of man. You just don't keep, uh, get the Holy Spirit and have all kinds of authority. Authority comes by relationship. And once that relationship was breached, he lost it. It comes by a process of building a relationship with the Lord. Jesus came as the second Adam. This is why he had to come as Adam, a second Adam, to regain what Adam lost. Adam was a carnal man. He was a physical man. God, Jesus, as God, could not come back and pay the price for humanity. He had to become a man. So he became a man and was born by Mary, his father, and, and, and this is people that are this is people that are doing research. Take it for what it is. They think they have found the, the the ark, the original ark, which was under where Jesus died on the cross. And when the earth shook, it split the ground, and the the blood his blood went on the ark of the covenant. This is what they said. Now the people that have found this took the samples of the blood and had it researched. And we have, what, uh, 48 chromosomes, 24 from your mother and 40, uh, 24 from your father. This blood only had 24. Now, is that true? Sounds to me, you know, that's really what happened, but is this actually the place? And I don't know. Jesus became a man. And he had to pay the sacrifice of death and go to the cross to regain back our authority as a man. And so as we come in relationship to Jesus Christ for what he did, we regain our authority and we walk in that authority that Christ gave because we're in relationship with him. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9 for though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of man, and being found in the appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those in heaven and those on the earth, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. In the garden was the battle of wills. 
Jesus won that battle when he went to the cross. He submitted his, his authority to the Father, came under the Father's authority, and submitted his will to the Father's will and walked in obedience. That's what we do. We submit our will to the Father's will and we walk before God in obedience. There's major battles before us that we must be ready to engage in. Jesus poked a stick in the devil's eye. He went up on Mount Hermon, and Mount Hermon is where the watchers came down and where Jesus was transfigured. Genesis 6.1, the sons of God came down. Those were watchers. Those were angels. It said the, wom- the women were fair, and so they started this breeding program, these angels, and it's, it's, I, could, I could go into a long dissertation about all of this. But there was angels, the corrupted man. Man become a hybrid. We call it, uh, some of you may have heard Nephilim. Man and angel. Giants. Goliath was of the tribe of giants. There's, they were all over the world. There's stories of them out South America. America's all over. It was all about polluting the seed of man. Because the devil wanted to have rule over this world, and he had to get rid of man. And so how do you get rid of them? You breed them out. And that's what was taking place was a breeding program. There was perversion of all kinds. A lot of stuff we've read is Greek mythology, is things that are half animal, half human, half this, half that, all this stuff. It was Noah, before Noah. Because God said that man has been totally corrupt. And it said that, but Noah and his generations meaning the bloodline of Noah was still pure. The rest of the world had been infiltrated by this demonic. And so, so this is what we're, we're dealing with here, is the devil, Jesus poked a stick in the devil's eye on Mount Hermon. Matthew 17. So Jesus said to them, because... Of your unbelief, for truly I say unto you, uh, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will be able to say to this mountain, Be thou removed and uh, removed from here to there, and it will, will be moved. And nothing will be impossible to you. So he's talking about, a, you think he's talking about a physical mountain here, but it says, However, this kind only come out except by prayer and fasting. This mountain of demonic activity that's going on in the earth back at Noah, Jesus said, today, the latter days, it will be as in the days of Noah. So this is stuff you don't hear in most churches. This is stuff you got to go to Bible school and stuff to learn about. But we need to know that this is a spiritual war we're in And the devil thinks he's going to win, and he's pulling out all the stops, but most of the church is ignorant of his devices. And the mountain here that Jesus went up on, where he was transfigured, was the mountain, Hermon, where these angels came down. And right there, he was transfigured. He came down off of that mountain, and within two weeks, he came down and went to Jerusalem, and he was on the cross. He poked a finger in the devil's eye. And the devil said, I'm going to take you out. See if you can, buddy. And what did he do? That was the whole plan all together. That man had to pay the blood, by the shedding of blood, for the remission of sins. Jesus' pure, untainted blood was shed upon the cross that paid the ultimate price so that you and I can be set free and walk in the exousia and deutimus power of God. 
Matthew 21, 18 through 22. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing there was a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on its leaves. And he said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered and died away. It's like, I've, read, I've read this before. Wow, that's something about this fig tree. But is it really about the fig tree? Verse 20. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, And truly I say unto you, If you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, Be removed and cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever thing you ask in prayer, Believing, you will receive it. Well, that kind of ties back here to 17. So Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, it surely I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, and say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and cat, removed from here to there, it, and it will move, nothing will be impossible to you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. There are pictures that Jesus draws us that this is a spiritual engagement. This is not about, we could by power, by the power of God, say to Mount Rainier, if it was to blow up, say be removed and cast into the sea by power. Or is it, the, dyna- uh, the demonic forces that rules over the, tr- the northwest, that mountain is symbolic of a mountain. We can say to the devil, the demonic force over this region, say, I bind you and I cast you into the sea. And it will wither and die. This is this, what we're talking about spiritual authority is when we're coming into the understanding of who we are in Christ. That we are in the midst of a war. And most people may not want to, I would rather not know about this stuff. But when these things come into your own home, come into the lives of people around you, come into your business, because we are fighting and engaging in about all-out war for mankind right now. And we're not going to get help from the government. Praise the Lord. But the war is to suppress us, the body of Christ, because we're the only threat that stops the devil from getting everything he wants. And so he will either try to eliminate us, get us intimidated, that we walk in fear, we walk in, in, in a lack of understanding, or do we rise up? A police officer, a friend, it was a pastor friend of mine in Yakima, his brother was a lieutenant on the Yakima police force. And he said, call, call him up and go do a ride-along. And because we were talking about what's going on in the city. I need to do that here. I haven't done it. But uh, it was interesting to see it from their perspective. So I went in and I called him. He said, yeah, come on down at such and such time. And so the sergeants were all gone. So he did the muster session. And it's truly interesting. They're talking about all the people. Well, so-and-so just got out of jail. And, uh, you know, this person, you know, this, all, there's a few people in the community that they're always watching because they're always the troublemakers. And it's kind of interesting. So, but we went out on the right, right. And so I was asking, you know, where do you get domestic violence? He said, that's everywhere. 
doesn't matter, economic, any. It's domestic violence is everywhere. I asked him about spiritual warfare. He, yeah, he said we've had things that uh, uh, people would rob, uh, go out and, and take headstones and put them in their yards and all this kind of stuff. And he said there was a time that I got a call that the home of cemetery had, <clears throat> there was, I got a call, it was at night, midnight or somewhere in there, and there was a big group of people out in the cemetery. And it's closed. It closes at sunset. So he shows up there, and he saw him out there. And so he, he by himself, goes walking out there. And uh, he says, you, the cemetery's closed. you, you got to leave. You can't make us leave! This way he did. Said, this, yeah, this won't do it. But he pulled out his pocket testament, and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, you can't be here. Get out of here. And they tripped all over themselves running. See, that's a person who walks in the authority and the power and understands what a thought power we have. And if the enemy rises up to us anywhere, devil, get out of here. You have no dominion in my home. You cannot do that over my family. You cannot do that over my church. You cannot do that over my community. We take dominion over you. And that's what we do here on Wednesdays. We pray and intercede for our community, for our nation. We pray. We have to engage. Because if we don't, if the church does not engage, the enemy will win. Jesus did it. He empowered us to do it. So it's time, church, wake up. Wake up and be the church. Walk in the authority that has been empowered to you. Jesus bought back our dominion. And now, as we come into Christ, he gives it back to us that we can rule and reign with him. And that we are under his guidance the Holy Spirit. Where does the Holy Spirit dwell? I, I, I keep doing this, and you have to get this. Where does the Holy Spirit dwell? In you. Not in this bu- He's in this building because you're here. We leave, He leaves. This is just a building. So wherever you go, you are walking in the Holy Spirit. He's in your heart. And you can hear him, and you can listen to him wherever you are. And and you might be driving down the road, and all of a sudden, the Holy prompt into your spirit says, take a left here. Well, why? Just take a left here. So you take a left and find out there's a big accident up the road. You know, who knows? There's these guys that have pursued this. I've never done it, but... People that are bold and say, the Lord says, I want you to turn here, and they turn here, and he, and he stop right here, and he stops, and, and he said, okay, I want you to go in that white house across the street there. And he said, Lord, I don't know anybody there. And the Lord, he says, Lord, you said, go in there. So he goes up, and says, okay. He knocks on the door. A guy comes to the door, and he says, I don't know why I'm here, but the Holy Spirit sent me, and he goes, ah! Martha, come up here! And she comes up, we were just praying in the back room, Lord, we need somebody to give us help, or whatever it was. And he happened to knock on the door right when they were praying because he was listening to the Holy Spirit. That's for all of us. That's what we're growing into. Now, I don't expect you to, all of you, start doing that tomorrow, but just start listening to the Holy Spirit. Listening to things, listening to the the, the Spirit inside of us, because He will lead us and guide us. He will take us to where He wants us to be. Because there is such a residue within the body of Christ that I believe, not necessarily here, but in the body of Christ of whole, that's asleep. They don't know who they are. They've never been taught who they are. Because we go to church, because the ministry team... They have it all. And so instead of praying for somebody out on the job, you need to come to my church so the pastor can lay hands on you and you'll get healed. Well, all right, I commission you in the name of Jesus Christ to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and wherever you are, you can lay hands on the sick. 
the same as me. Because the Holy Spirit is not respecter of persons. Like My job title is to equip you for the work of the ministry. And that's what I will be held accountable for. So other than me equipping you and training you and teaching you these, these fundamental principles of the kingdom, I will stand before the Lord just as you will on my basic function of my life. And then I will also be judged by, did I equip you as the Holy Spirit wanted me to? Or did I get you to look at me as this mighty man of God? <laughs> you can kiss my shoes. You know, you know it's like... <laughs> that's not what it is. I'm a brother just like you. And sister. I'm not a sister, but I'm a brother. To, I have sisters. <laughs> just... I guess my heart is, I just want us to walk into that place that it just becomes natural for us to flow in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Just relax with it. Don't build up expectations. Well, there, we have new people, so I can tell another story. <laughs> this is story 45. No. I was over at Lowe's here, and some of you know a friend of ours, Dempsey. And at that time, he used to like to walk Lowe's because he used construction, so he likes to walk in a hardware store. So I went over there, and here's Dempsey walking, and he said, hey, Dempsey, how you doing? Went over, and we started talking, and, and, uh, and so he, uh, uh, as we were talking, he said, this lady is there, one of the workers, said, uh, call her Martha. I said, Martha, come over here. So she comes over and said, Martha, this is, this is Pastor Dan. And Martha's been having these migraines, and she keeps losing work and all this stuff and these migraines. And uh, would you pray for her? And so she kind of goes, well, I didn't know at the time, found out later, she was raised in a Pentecostal church. So it's like, in the name of Jesus! I said, you won't even know. So she, with eyes open, I didn't close my eyes or anything, I just touched her elbow. Lord, I pray for Martha right now. I pray and I rebuke these, these migraines in the name of Jesus that she won't have them anymore. And I got that point. I didn't even say amen. Someone said, hey, Martha, we need you over here. So she took off. Shoot, it's not going to work because I didn't say Amen. See how we can get into, so a few weeks later I go back, and there's Dempsey walking again. Hey, Dempsey, how's it going? And we are talking, he said, and he said, oh, I'm going to tell you, Martha, you prayed for? She was like missing, like every week she was missing for these migraines. She's been, I talked to her, and she's been uh, two weeks, hasn't missed any work. And I said, Martha, you've been, how's your migraines? Yeah, I don't have migraines anymore. He says, you know what happened? A pastor prayed for me. See, that's, I, I did that as a brother. He put the, ta the pastor ta tag on me. But it's, you have the same anointing of the Holy Spirit as I do. I may have, have been using it more, but I am wanting you and helping you grow into the maturity where you will feel not ashamed to use it, but just to see what happens. Like another story. A guy goes to jury duty. He's on his way to jury duty. And he said on the way in, he says, Lord, if there's anybody you want me to pray for or talk to, you lead me. So he sits down, there's about 100, 125 people, whatever, sitting there, he says, Lord, is there anybody? And there's a guy in a wheelchair. And he said, talk to, go talk to him. Okay, so he goes over and starts striking up a conversation. And, and he said, do you want me to pray for your, your, your legs? He said, oh, I, I, I can't walk. And I said, yeah, but 
can we just pray? And the, and the guy says, well, what if nothing happens? Well, the young man said, well, what if something does happen? And the guy said, okay. So he prayed for him. He got up, started walking. Hey, my legs are healed. They're healed. He prayed for eight other people in that, that jury room that day. See, that's, that's the authority and the power that we have to move in the presence of the Holy Spirit. How many opportunities do we walk by in our life every day or every week or something that we could have, should have, could have, would have? I think we need to worship the Lord this morning. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, His courts with praise. And, and Lord, I just pray right now, Lord, this is your word. This is not my word. Lord, you're doing something in each one of us. You are helping us to go deeper in you. You are helping us to understand who we really are in you. And Lord, as children of the Most High, Lord, I pray that we can have fun. Have fun in your presence. And have fun ministering. Lord, and have fun moving out in the Holy Spirit and not be afraid and not be intimidated. Uh, what if nothing does happen? Well, we'll be obedient if nothing happens. We'll have uh, done what you want us to do. And Lord, we'll have fun at it. And we'll, we'll walk in an excitement and anticipation. Lord, that we, the body of Christ, we, every one of us here is special and unique it has special gifts, special talents, special abilities. Lord, we have, we, each one of us know people that none of us, the uh, rest of us will even know. Lord, you are filtering us into a community, Lord, because you love this Tri-City, the Columbia Basin. You love this area. And there's people here that you love, that need you. And Lord, I pray let your anointing fall upon each one of us as we worship this morning. Let your anointing fall upon us with the excitement and anticipation of walking with you. And Lord, if we pray for someone and nothing happens, we will not be discouraged. We will keep pressing forward. We will keep moving forward. Lord, because we will leave the result, leave the result into your hands. We want to be obedient to pray, to intercede to do what you've called us to do, that we can walk in the authority and the power that you have entrusted into us, that you purchased back for us. And Lord, that we can walk in the dominion of that power and authority with love, tenderness, and compassion. Lord, we believe you're going to do great signs and wonders and miracles in us. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. As we worship and pray, you can stand up.